Now, one thing you might be thinking after we talked about modularity and how modularity is uh, one good measure to determine whether the network has been partitioned well is the obvious question. Why not optimize modularity directly? I mean, if modularity is the measure that we're using to determine whether the, the partitioning is good or not, then why would we do anything else other than simply optimizing modularity? Well, because first of all, it's very hard. <laughs> uh, huge modularity perfectly um, would require an, an absolutely untreatable amount of uh, operations. If we wanted to actually find the absolute maximal modularity. However, it can be approximated. So there are algorithms for approximating. And unsurprisingly, it was also proposed by Newman. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it came slightly, I think, like one or two years after the, the first one. And it's, I, I, that's not really the official name. I call it Newman's fast algorithm because that's all he, he calls it in, in the title, like a fast algorithm for community detection. But um, it, came, it came slightly uh, later than the first one. But it's important to understand that this, it's really fast, first of all. It's really um, geared towards the optimization of modularity as a cost function. But it's also not as good as the previous one in terms of the actual precision of the, of the partition, right? I will talk about this later, but it's, it, this is a greedy algorithm. What does it mean to be a greedy algorithm? It means that at every iteration, we are, uh, well, in, in a sense, well, anyway, it's, it's a greedy algorithm that at every iteration, we're choosing the best solution that optimizes the, the modularity, and then we're, we're using that solution. And then we go to the next step, then we do it again. We take the, the best possible step towards uh, the maximal modularity, and then we go on. So in a, in a way, it's, it's like iterative optimization that you're, you use, you're used to, right? Like even when you're doing gradient descent, there's no gradient descent here. But even when you're doing gradient descent, you're kind of doing the same thing. You're, you're taking one small step towards the, 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 the minimum of the cost function, then you update the, the problem a little bit, then you take another step, another little step, and so on. In this case, we're doing the same, but we're doing it in a greedy way. Um, but anyway, the greedy approach, this is a greedy approach, and in this case, it's also hierarchical. The, the previous one was also hierarchical, right? But the previous one was divisive. This one is agglomerative. So this one is very, very, very much like the hierarchical clustering that we saw in the first lecture, where every node is in its own community at first. So you have as many communities as um, nodes in the network. And so we're building the, the dendrogram bottom up again. In the previous, uh, in the previous algorithm, we were, building, we were building the dendrogram top down by splitting, right? That's why it's called the divisive algorithm. In this case, we're again back to the to the initial proposal of the clustering, and we're doing building it uh, bottom up again. So basically, the idea is incredibly simple, right? Every every node starts as being its own community, so we don't talk about nodes anymore. Talk about communities, even though in the beginning they only have one node each. Then we merge the two communities that improve Q the most. So it's this idea that at every step, we're going to choose between all possible edges of the network between communities, what is the one that will improve our cost or our modularity or our quality the most. Then we merge them into a, one new community that now has two nodes. <clears throat> and then you have to update the adjacency matrix of the, the, of the graph to reflect the merged communities, because now since we, we merged two nodes into one community, that community all, uh, has edges that go out to all the nodes that were 
the neighbors of the original two nodes that we connected, right? So it, since we put these two guys in the same place, now basically this one uh, community that we have, that let's call it like a super node of the community, it has edges going out to all the neighbors of the previous guys who, uh, you know, uh, were already were were connected. They 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 had neighbors. That's that's what I mean. The guys who were mixed, they had neighbors, and now the the edges go out to these to these neighbors, right? And then um, and also you have to that that's that's something that's a little bit different than we're used to. You also have to count to to count the number of edges that are within the network because these two guys that were merged, they they for sure were connected to each other, right? Because we merged them, and you can only merge two communities if they're connected. Because uh, if they're not connected, they will never improve the modularity, right? So when you, when you merge in step two, when you merge the two communities that improve Q the most, you don't go through all pairs of nodes. You only go through the pairs of nodes that are because that's what you care about. So so then you have to every time you do this this update, you have to update also the number of internal nodes in the community which is not something you do usually with nodes because nodes usually don't have edges that points to themselves. But in this case, they, they do because the communities have edges within them. So it's just make sure that uh, you, you have to update this also uh, at every step. Then basically you repeat two until there's only one community. So again, like, like the previous hierarchical algorithm, you just go back to two and again, merge the two communities that improve Q the most, but, and, and just, of course, remembering that now we have updated communities because of the communities that we joined in the first step, in the, in the first and the previous step. Um, and then you just keep doing that. Up, merge two communities. Update all the possible like edges and internal edges, external edges, everything. Go back again. Find the two communities that improve Q the most. Merge them and so on and so on until there's only one community. And then again, you have just built the... Um, the dendrogram from uh, the top. And, and this is the algorithm that you will implement next week. Now, check the PDF of weekly exercise three. And uh, because there, there's, there are more details about the algorithm, it's not just this. And, and also, if you have doubts, also check the paper because the paper has even more details, right? Uh, for example, the step when you're updating the adjacency matrix of the graph, that step, Actually, you you don't have to go through all uh, all the edges of the graph because, for example, if you have if you have two nodes that are like not connected to the two communities that you just merged, you don't have to care about them because nothing changes for them, right? It only changes for those nodes that were actually connected to the two communities that you just merged. That that's where it, that's uh, where let's say where the graph changes. But everyone else who was completely uh, unaware of this change, you don't have to to worry about them. So it's not like you're updating the entire matrix uh, at every step of the process because you don't need to. So uh, this is something you you should take a look, or else it's going to be uh, quite slow the algorithm. And the idea here is that it's really fast, and it it is actually really fast. So check the PDF and uh, check the paper and ask questions. This, I, will, I have to say, this is actually a pretty simple algorithm. Um, this, uh, this is an example of a comparison between the results of this uh, faster algorithm and the previous one, right? The German Neumann algorithm, which is much slower, uh, but a little bit more accurate. So you can see that here, the green squares are the, the actual like slow algorithm and the blue, uh, little circles with some little, uh, let's say, um, let's say that uh, whiskers <laughs> are the fast new one, the new one. Now you can see that the number, the x-axis here is the number of intercommunity edges per vertex. So basically, it's like how many edges exist between communities, and the the less to the left, the, the less you have, the the clearer are the communities, right? So because if you have very tight communities with just a few edges between them, then it's it's like an easy problem for an algorithm because it's, the communities are very clear, right? 
Uh, so up to, I don't know, here up to like four, five, six, I would say, even up to five, basically both algorithms are very good. They're, they almost give modularity of one. Actually, they do give modularity of one for, for quite a few, um, for, for quite some time. Up to, but up to number five, they're both super good. However, the German new algorithm is uh, slightly better. It's, 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 it's so, like, it's almost nothing, but it is slightly better. You can't even see it, actually. But it is slightly better. Uh, and, and then here, for example, you can see that the, um, the one, the fast new one kind of gets down a little bit and gets a little bit worse. But it's just so little worse. Uh, and then, surprisingly, as, as the communities become worse and worse to detect, because we have more, more edges between them, then actually fast new one becomes even better, which, which is completely crazy because it's, it's supposed to be approximate. So, uh, so, but, it be, but it becomes better than the, the previous one for, for, let's say, more confusing problems, harder problems. Uh, and it, that is without counting that it's super fast, right? It's really, really fast, actually. And, f and this is an example of a real life application of this. It's also given in the same paper, but it's an interesting example where they extracted a, a network of co authorship. A network of co authorship is basically like people who wrote papers together, right? So they, there is this archive uh, website where people put, publish papers there. So you can just go there and, like, uh, how do you say, um, crawl this, this website and, and extract information there of who wrote papers together. Then you can build this co-authorship network. And, and they did it and the, they, have, they ended up with 56,276 vertices. Which is quite, a, quite crazy, right? It's like 50,000 author, authors of uh, physics papers, which is quite, quite crazy. And anyway, but it's a very, very, very large network, actually, it's 56,000. I mean, by today's standards, maybe not too much, but it's, it's quite large. And the, the interesting thing is that they, they don't know, they, they, the runtime of the fast new algorithm was 42 minutes for this, but they don't know, like, they can't, add, they estimated that if they run this with the previous algorithm, it would take like three to five years to actually finish running which is obviously quite crazy. I mean, they didn't, they don't know for sure, but uh, they estimated that. And while the runtime of fasting was around 42 minutes. And they, they found a quite interesting, like strong community structure. So zero, more than 0 0.7, which is strong, uh, which is interesting because then, and, and expected actually, because uh, authors of, of papers, they, I mean, they do collaborate with lots of people that, but, they tend to, to form clusters of people who actually work together a lot, maybe because they're in the same university or in the same department or in the same group, and they just know each other. They meet in, in conferences and they, they end up, you know, um, writing papers together. And there are, the, there are four large communities with around 77% of the nodes. And these are this, these communities on condensed matter, uh, high energy physics, astrophysics. And this one is also condensed matter, but let's say in a, in a slightly different sub subject, plus 600 other smaller communities that they didn't really show here. So these four communities account for 77% of the nodes, which is a lot. Like it's a very strong community structure, right? Most of the nodes by far are within two, four communities. And then there's all the rest. And the cool thing about a hierarchical uh, algorithm like this one is that you can do this interesting analysis of taking the, the for example, choosing a certain cluster, this one with 9,350, and then just expanding that, and you can keep on uh, going into that, right, in the same way that you did with the previous one, because it's hierarchical, right? So it, you, it's interesting that you can zoom in like that. And then, uh, then, then this is, the, the the sub communities within this big community and then if you take one of these sub communities of 134 vertices you can still see like the algorithm is doing really well right it's it's a fast algorithm it's supposed to be approximate but it's doing really really well i mean if you if you look at the layout of the network here and the color that where the algorithm actually split these communities 
and you can see it's uh, it looks pretty good. And and this is a single research group, and it happens to be the research group of the author of the paper. So you know it's something that he's uh, familiar with, so he could uh, check and see yeah that this makes sense. Uh, but you can see it's uh, I mean it's incredibly uh, good. This this one algorithm, even though it's uh, super fast, and this is the one you guys are going to implement. So uh, good luck with that, and I hope you. It's not really that uh, complicated.